see a ton of passion and I see people who are trying really hard to, 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 to change the narrative of what a hunter looks like. Mm-hmm. Right. Because that narrative exists. We just don't know about it. Right. And I, I, I had a friend of mine in, in Virginia who was very, is a very passionate archer competition archer. Right. You know, most people think, oh, like black people don't hunt. Right. And I remember him telling me about his like grandfather's and great grandfather's hunt camp. Right. And like, I just didn't know. Right. Mm-hmm. I was just ignorant. And it's mm-hmm. like, yeah, man, there's this whole ecosystem that exists that we just don't know about because media isn't putting it out there. Welcome to the Bunkhouse Podcast, broadcasting from the confluence of outdoor recreation and nature connectivity. I'm your host, Josh Crumpton, founder of Spoke Hollow Outdoors and the Los Savaje Food Truck. My life as a rancher, guide, foodie, and conservationist has provided the opportunity to meet some really great people. And the Bunkhouse is where we get to introduce them to you. In this episode, we introduce you to Bashir Ben Halim, a fellow Texan, an avid wing shooter, the Texas ambassador for hunters of color, a good friend, husband, father, and one smart dude. Bashir came out to visit Spoke Hollow for an upland hunt. Afterward, we hit the bunkhouse and talked about mentorship, diversity in the hunting space, ducks, turkey, quail, and other good stuff. With all that said, let's get this thing started. Let's jump in with you just telling me a little bit about your background in the hunting space. Yeah, so I um so I kind of have an interesting background in which my father's, you know, first generation here in the US. My dad's from Libya. Uh, my mom's a sixth generation Texan uh, from Williamson County. Uh, I tell people like my sister did ancestry.com or we we're 23 me, excuse me. And uh, we were 49% Irish and 49 and a half percent Libyan. Right. So I kind of have a unique, unique in that my mother's people only married other Irish people. My father's people only have married other Libyan people uh, until I came around. And so, yeah, man. So I grew up here in, in, in Texas, born in Texas, lived in California, New Mexico, back to Texas when I was a teenager and then went to college here, but uh, started hunting when I was 14 with my cousins on my mom's family's ranch and just kind of ignited a passion. You know, it's um, that ranch is in Texas. It's in Texas. Texas. Yeah, it's in the northwest corner of Williamson County uh, on the Burnett County line. Been in my mom's family since 1852. Wow. Uh, and I believe, and I may have this wrong, but we have the, I believe the oldest continuously lived in house in the county. Wow. So the house and somebody's was, still yep, to this so day. So someone still lives in that house to this day. So lives there it, now. Uh, my mom's cousin does. Her name's Maude Allen. So she lives there in the house. There's you know, historic registry. It's a Texas century ranch, all that kind of good Texas history stuff, man. So nice. I grew up going there. Now, my dad was not my dad. My grandfather was a a cattle rancher up until the the drought in 52. And my mom was the first generation to move to town. So kind of one. She left. Yeah. Yeah. My mom mom was born uh, into that rock house and uh, moved to Austin when she was four. So. So your mom moved to town. What town? Yeah. So they moved to Austin to Rollingwood. Okay. My granddad uh, built a house in, in, in Rollingwood and that's where she grew up. So. Yeah, so I'm kind of a, a central Texan at heart, certainly. So um, at 14, hunting with your dad? Hunting with my uncle, with actually. Uncle. Actually, my uncle and my aunt. Oh, right. Really? So my aunt, my aunt Ruth took me hunting with her, my older cousins who hunted. Uh I would say one of them is still a very passionate hunter. The rest kind of dropped off. But yeah, I went, you know, I had the opportunity. Someone just took me as a kid hunting. I hunted for I hunted for four years before I shot uh, my first animal at 18, which was the wow. year and a half old, you know, eight point buck. And and just, I remember where I was when I, I remember where I was, what time it was, by who I was with. I was with my cousin, Sam. Like I remember everything about that moment. And it just really, for me was transformational, right? It just is one of those things that I'll never forget and certainly always appreciate. So that's how I got started hunting. And And that, of course, not of course, but that uh, lended into sort of exploring what this sort of experience is about of being connected to the land. I was telling you a little earlier when we were out hunting, you know, when I was a kid in California, I had the opportunity to spend a lot of time on one of the big ranches out there, tagging along with biologists and ranch hands. And 
learning about cattle and working cattle and roundups and all that stuff. So I kind of had a maybe a little different experience than your average Texas kid, but certainly was exposed to ranching and wildlife from a very young age and just you know, it's a wonder I didn't become a wildlife biologist other than someone didn't tell me about it. But yeah, man, just really a love of, of wild places and and wild things and, and of wild creatures. You know, I didn't hunt until much later in life. Yeah. And, but my passion came through fishing. Do you, do you fish at all? We haven't talked about yeah, that. So I, I fished, I grew up, uh, bass fishing with my buddies, just kind of your, your standard suburban creeks and ponds and, you know, actually, it's kind of funny. I uh, was not a terribly good student and I was supposed to be is kind of a longer story. But every day my buddy Drew and I would go fishing. Uh, and then one day we decided to skip practice and go fishing instead, which sounded great until I got a treble hook in my face. Oh, no, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was 18 years old. Oh, and, my gosh. Uh, got this like double treble hook in my face. And uh, I try and go to the hospital without you know insurance or anything and trying to get them to pull it out. And they tell me absolutely not. So then I have to go own up to my mom that I not only skipped summer school because I was behind, uh, but uh, now had a fish hook in my face that needed Where to come Where was this out. in your face? Where did uh, it was like right like here. Uh, it was, you know, and I remember she, uh, my mother's great mother, she she insisted that we went to the best plastic surgeon and he laughed. He said, oh, we're just going to yank it out, right? <laughs> and so he, he does the whole push the hook through, cut off the barb trick, and out it goes six hours later. But yeah, Ouch. I was a pretty, I'm a pretty uh, avid fisherman. And, and I got into fly fishing when I invited myself onto a spring break trip with some acquaintances. And I went to Broken Bow, Oklahoma and fished for trout when I was probably 20 or 21 years old. And That's um, cool. I haven't fished there yet. You know, Broken Bow is one of those places people bag on it because they're stalkers. But, you know, my opinion is always this, right? If it gets someone into something and ignites a passion, I think that's great. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, you know, whatever is your on ramp. Yeah. And it's nice to have, I was like to say, it's nice to have those soft, easy on ramps. Yeah. And sometimes that's stalker fish and sometimes that's deer over feeders and yep. sometimes that's preserved birds. Yep. But like, that's your on ramp. That's a really good segue to talk about on ramps. Cause that seems yeah. to be something that you've got a full-time job. You work a lot to talk to you. You're yeah. like always traveling for work <laughs> to a lot of different yeah. places and going to some pretty cool places. Yeah. You have a very busy schedule, but you're passionate about this enough that you, you have taken on this role as an ambassador with HOC for Texas to create these on ramps. You want to tell me about that? Yeah. So I think for me, I think about, you know, these barriers to entry, right? And I think about a lot about how fulfilling being outdoors is and, and pursuing a passion. And that really is what motivates me to say, you know, I love these places. I, you know, I've, I've fished all over the West. I've, I've you know, I've traveled been to 49 out of 50 states, right? And Which I've, one are you missing? I'm missing Alaska. Alaska. So we'll go to Alaska next year Save for a caribou for hunt. Last. And And the idea is to to somehow piggyback that with a Harlequin duck hunt. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. to say I've gone full send into waterfowl is yeah. pretty serious. Uh, uh, but yeah, man, I just, you know, I think the thing for me that f why the outdoors feels so significant is how small it makes me feel. Right. Like I think when we're, we're hustling and bustling and in our jobs and, you know, particularly in like what I do today, I get to make a lot of, you know, quote unquote, important decisions in a business, right? It's nice to feel like you're not in control. It's nice to just be present in the moment. And I feel like there's a real therapy and healing in it. Even if you, you know, I've done a lot of, I tell people everybody needs to go to therapy and everybody should have a, have a, have a therapist and do counseling. Right. But I think that there's a part of it for me that really just reminds me to recenter and to be present. And that's what I love about the outdoors. And what I love about just sitting in a deer blind, right? Like I've, I've, I've hunted a lot of places now and, and every one is a fulfilling experience if you're open to it. And so that's for me, what really motivates me to show people this thing I love and, and to be around people who love it as well. You know, it, it's, 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 it's wonderful to be around passionate people. And I think the outdoors is filled with a lot of passionate people. And that's, you know, that's just the scene I'm into. Right. And mm -hmm. I, and I love it. Yeah. And well, and you know, we, we talked about, I want to circle back to HOC, but, Things that you're passionate about. Yeah. We talked about snow geese. Yeah. <laughs> we, we talked about waterfowling. Yeah. 
Tell me about the passion that you have for that and how did that start? Yeah. So I was with my dad in probably 2010 going from DC to Philadelphia and went to the decoy carving museum in Arv de Grace, Maryland. And if you've never been there, I think everyone should go because uh, it's just incredible. Right. So I, I really had awareness of like, you know, I think duck dynasty was pretty big at that point. It really wasn't my jam, but the waterfowling culture and the history of it really kind of intrigued me. And so I went to this museum with my dad and just fell in love with this culture, right. Of people going and being so committed to going and pursuing something. And so I tried for, I don't know, seven, eight, maybe 10 years to get somebody to take me duck hunting, right. <laughs> to get into a crew. And I met a good friend and now a really good friend of mine, Mike, who opened that door for me. And he, you know, he runs an outfit in Virginia and and an outfit in Iowa. And so I started Canada goose hunting and duck hunting with him. And I remember, I think it was my third or fourth, the first two or three hunts, we just absolutely got skunked. And I remember I was running a little bit late to meet him in the field. And I watched, I don't know, maybe three or 400 Canada geese do it. (laughs) I mean, just like all dump into this field. And I, I, I remember everyone was out in the layout and I didn't even know what a layout was at that point, but everyone was in the layout and I'm just sitting on the sideline watching these birds dump into this, in the soybean field. And I just thought, Oh my God, I have to do that. <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, and I, I got amazing. really fortunate that I got in with this crew of guys who are just incredibly passionate waterfowlers uh, and he created opportunity for me and, you know, really just embraced me and, and, you know, put a lot of hard work in. Right. I think one of the things that, uh, particularly really in all waterfowling, it's, it's a labor of love, right? It's a lot of effort to go trudge out into a marsh and load decoys and, and get dogs and all that kind of stuff. And so that's how I got into it. And as part of that, I, I cook and, and help guide in a, in a snow goose camp every spring in Iowa. And yeah, man, I mean, there's just, there's something that is just takes your breath away. And I don't care how many times it happens that every time I see just, you know, hundreds of thousands of birds, do, you know, scrapping out a living. It's like, I just sit there and just go like, Oh my God, like, this is incredible. Like we were picking up decoys, um, about a week and a half ago and we watched, uh, probably a 10,000 duck feed form. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's just like, I don't know, man, it gives me the giggles, right? Like yeah, yeah. Uh, in a way that deer hunting doesn't, doesn't like, I like to deer hunt, but the, the water fouling just, you know, the, the birds are beautiful and just seeing them make their living is just, I don't know, man, it's next level. I love hearing the sound of the wings. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. Man, the yeah, sound yeah. of the wings. And, and they're all a little different. They are. They it's, are. It's, they are. Every bird's a little bit different. We had, um, I remember, I mean, this is like, we had one of the first years I went out to Iowa, we were laying a spread and we had, I think three or four pintails buzz us at like no more than 10 feet. And I just remember just like, yeah. I just couldn't <laughs> take it, man. I just giggled. You know, it was just like yeah. so good, you yeah. know, it was just so good. And, and yeah, man, I just, the, the birds, you know, they don't care about, about us right but they we got to care a lot about them and their habitat and you know the 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 impact from agriculture and 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 habitat loss and and all those things right are very very present i always tell people like you know we care a lot about the amazon but i don't know why you you care less about you know the 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 wetland prairies of houston right and katie right yeah yeah these are you know the the animals that live there don't care any less about their habitat right and so That to me feels very present and that's what kind of motivates me. Well, it's easier to take care of those places too. It is right right there. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lower lift than say the rainforest, which both things are important. Critically important. It's like work at home, work in your backyard. Yeah. 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 That's, that's pretty cool. The, the teal, a wad of teal for me. Yeah. It's like early season. Yeah. Like I love dove hunting. Don't get, I mean, I love dove hunting, but dove hunting to me is this communal thing. Yeah. It's about gathering. It's about friends. It's about family. It's, it's kind of like a grilling opportunity and <laughs> yeah. share a meal. And, but teal season, when teal season opens and that first wad of teal, like, <laughs> yeah. like flies over the top of your blind. Holy cow. It's phenomenal. So HOC fast forward many years. Yeah. You're, you're now, you've already been, you're already an addicted waterfowler yep. before you came to HOC. Yeah. You'd, you'd shot deer, you know, you, I'd say you're an, you're an accomplished hunter at this point. Yeah. I would say, you know, I've gone through waves, right? Like 
you know, I've, I've, I've shot all my tags, right. <laughs> I, I've shot all my Turkey tags. Like, uh-huh. you know, I've definitely, um, you know, and I don't like those things any less. Right. But you know, the, the waterfowling for sure. And so I came to HOC really through a waterfowling opportunity. Um, they were uh, hosting a hunt at black duck revival in Brinkley, Arkansas. You know, I was living in Virginia. So I would drive every Thanksgiving and Christmas from, Virginia through Arkansas back to Dallas to see my family. And I just always looked up at the sky and just, you know, if you, if you haven't been to Arkansas or you haven't been to Mississippi and seen the sky, it's, it's next level. Right. And so they posted this like, Hey, you know, apply to come hunt. And I was selected and, and, uh, had the opportunity to go there and, and meet people. And it really was just an incredible space to share. You know, one of the things for me was just feeling very calm in that space and not having your group of strangers, right? There's people from all over the country, but coming together and sharing in that space and sharing and really teaching people is one of the first times that I realized that I had something to teach somebody, mm-hmm. right? Like what'd you teach? You know, it wasn't even, it was just like about letting them know they'd shot the bird, right? Yeah. Especially with new hunters, right? They don't have a lot of confidence in their shot. But, you know, when you've, when you've shot for a while, you kind of know what birds you hit and what birds you don't. Mm-hmm. And so there was a, a, a guy who I knew very clearly he'd shot that geese and he was really doubting it. I just said, no, man, like, I guarantee you, like, that's your bird and you should be really proud of it, right? Look at you being a great mentor. I'm, <laughs> I'm in the blind. I'm like, I killed that one. I killed that one. I killed that one. They're like, Josh, you didn't even shoot. I was like, yeah, I killed it anyways. That's my yeah, You're like no, my really. buddy Tyler, right? I always joke with him. Like when I'm sitting next to Tyler, my, I'm, I'm 0 for 100 and Tyler's 100 for 100. 100. Right? But yet when he's not there, I'm shooting birds. Right? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I just scream. I got it. It's mine. It's mine. It's mine. That's the first. It's first definitely advice my band, band, right? <laughs> but um, so you were out there with Jonathan and... Did you, at this point, you're not, you hadn't signed up to become the ambassador. No, not at all. Not at all. Right. So I had, um, finally had the opportunity to move home to Texas and had just reached out to HOC and said, Hey, you know, my family's got this ranch and I'd like to mentor some people. Right. And they came back and said like, well, what do you think about being the ambassador? Right. And I was like, I don't know, you know, kind of like, and then I kind of slept on it and, and thought about it and talked with my wife about it. And I said, you know what? I think this is something I want to do. And, and you know, just kind of realized that, you know, I had a unique space and perspective to offer, you know, coming out of a ranching family, you know, you can talk to ranchers about ranching. Right. Uh, and I realized that, you know, sort of my perspective on life lent me pretty well to building relationships with people uh, and showing them there's a commonality there and, and building really, you know, the groundwork. And that's really my goal with HOC is, you know, I'll serve for an, as ambassador for two years. And my goal is to really lay the groundwork and build the relationships for ongoing programming. Tell me a little bit more about Hunters of Color and tell, because not, maybe yeah. not everybody knows. Yeah, so Hunters of Color is, uh, is a organization that focuses on conservation and hunting for black, indigenous, and people of color. And it is not a, a not an organization that focuses exclusively on creating opportunities for X affinity group or Y affinity group, right? It looks at really holistically, how do we create space and hold space for people to learn with the express goal of keeping them hunting, right? So them engaged in conservation, buying hunting licenses and participating in this community, right? And so, you know, for me, it was very much a place where I felt comfortable and and people I respected and you know, Lydia and, and Jimmy and, you know, their buddy founded this, right? And they're young guys, or you're young people and who are just passionate. And I just was really drawn to that passion and said, hey, man, how can I support, right? Like, I don't think HOC always gets it perfectly right, like any place, but I see a ton of passion and I see people who are trying really hard to, 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 to change the narrative of what a hunter looks like, mm-hmm. right? Because that narrative exists. We just don't know about it, right? And I, I, I had a friend of mine in, in Virginia, who was very, is a very passionate archer, competition archer, right? You know, most people think, oh, like black people don't hunt, right? And I remember him telling me about his like grandfather's and great grandfather's hunt camp, right? And like, I just didn't know, right? Mm-hmm. I was just ignorant. And it's mm-hmm. like, yeah, man, there's this whole ecosystem that exists that we just don't know about because media isn't putting it out there, but we should talk about these stories and we should share these experiences and we should really 
you know, I, I hate to say amplify, but we should just expose people to it. Right. I think there's a lot of times where people have the perception that like, oh, this group's getting, you know, undue exposure. Right. And I get why people would think that, but I think that's a very sort of like first glance, right? I call it step one thinking, right? Like they sort of just go like, oh, this is my reaction versus saying like, hey, what else is there there? Like, why do I think this way? Or why do I have that perception? Or is this even the right perception to hold? Well, yeah, I think it's definitely, you know, I've, I, I talked to a lot of people about it and I, and I'm pretty open about talking about my idea. Well, I think all of our idea is to have a point in time where we don't need to have yeah. a hunters of color, where we don't need to have uh, brown folks fishing, where we don't need to have where these things to think of it being any other way than just a diverse it population <laughs> right. Right? Yeah. would be weird. Right. And, yeah. and that's one of the things, right. So I was talking with Jimmy about, uh, I think a podcast you did, right. Where you talked about like, Hey, what's the, what's the exit plan. Right. Mm-hmm. And they were like, I was I talking about the podcast and they were like, man, we got a 20 year plan to be obsolete. Right. And I think that's like one of the things I feel like really energized by, Yeah, which is that it's not just this ongoing, um, you know, let's keep doing this. It's like, no, let's, let's have a plan for where we accomplish a goal. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the other part about HOC that I really respect and value is that we don't see ourselves as an organization that needs to exist in perpetuity. Mm-hmm. Right. But really an organization that can build a strong community and that community then sustains. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and you have a problem that you want to solve. Yeah. And so the goal is to solve the, to problem, solve the problem, not create, not create a revenue or a business or any of those things. Correct. And that's, yeah. that's where nonprofits I think sometimes can become businesses. And so it'll be really nice to see a nonprofit say, you know what? Our job is to put ourselves out of business. Correct. Because yeah. this problem goes away. And I don't know what that looks like. I would love to, to on another date, like I'd actually love to get Jimmy and Lydia and like find out like, what does this 20 year plan look like? Like how, what's the roadmap so we can share it with everybody so that we can start going down that roadmap. Yeah, um, man. Let's do how it. we next, normalize next February. We're hopefully going to do a big hunt out in West Texas. So yeah, we, let's do yeah. a podcast out there. We will. Let's, we will. let's hash that out. Right. Yeah. That would be good because, because that is the goal is and and one of the challenges that I see is I've talked to uh, predominantly white males that have been in the industry that have made a living in this industry. And, um, there are funds that they used to have access to sponsorships, things that they have, that have evaporated. They're not there for them anymore. And uh, it's always a tough conversation because I've had these conversations where people say, well, that's not fair. Those funds that used to fund my project or my, my participation in marketing of these products is now gone because it's getting shuffled into an HOC or a Brown folks fishing or a, and you know, I don't, I don't want to just look at them and say tough shit. Yeah, no, <laughs> you know? I think that's I incredibly mean, unfair. Because that's right? not that's not fair. Because I I get it and I understand it, and I'm like, man, I understand how that's frustrating for you. That it feels like there's a loss of opportunity because you're not female or because you're not brown or because you're not you know whatever it is. But there also needs to be an acknowledgement that that these programs are important and that, and that funds need to go in that direction. I just, you know, my, my big thing about it is that there's a lot of pressure on the hunting community, right? We're not a huge community relative to the, to the general population in the U S and certainly globally, right? Like we see, you know, if you look at European culture, the hunting model is very different and it's very exclusive. And so my response to people who see it shrinking is, well, maybe the model changed, but why aren't you adapting, right? We can't insist that things stay the same because the world doesn't stay the same. It changes every day. And so, you know, while I want to fully acknowledge the impact, what I want to ask those people will say like, hey, man, why don't you take your knowledge and energy and instead of feeling frustrated, think about what you can participate in to move the dynamic forward. Right. And that's that's always for me, whether it's in my professional work and my personal life. You know, I, I using I had an example a couple of weeks ago in my own life. My brother said this to me. Right. I was feeling very frustrated about some work stuff. And the point where I was just like, I, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, I'm done. Like, I don't need to do this. And he said, like, hey, man, 
and I love my brother. He's a great guy. He said, like, why don't you take that energy into organizing? Right. <laughs> and executing. <laughs> right. And, and I slept on it and I woke up in the morning and I called my brother and I was like, you seen you're 100 percent right. Like instead of just sitting here becoming angrier and angrier and angrier, I could spend five or 10 or 20 percent of that same energy into organizing and executing. And that's what I did. Right. Yeah. And so that to me is like where I want to spend my time, which is I think that the pan, the pie doesn't have to be small. I think it can be immense. I would love, I would love a movement in this country of, you know, 80% of Americans who's, who love hunting, who love conservation and are beating the doors down in Washington every day saying, not only are you not going to sell public land, not only are you going to like not fund conservation efforts, right. Both on private and public land, but we're going to expand that. Right. Because we believe this is so valuable to our country and our society that everyone should have access to it. And that's, you know, that's maybe a pipe dream, but that's, that's ultimately where I see this going. And that's why for me, when we talk about bringing new people into the hunting world and into conservation, that's the output. That's the goal, right? Is that we end up having, you know, this really robust dynamic in which people feel passionate about public land and about private land, about conservation, about, you know, the salamanders in our creeks, you know, like we talk about megafauna a lot, but like we, you know, we, we have to be equally as passionate about the birds that live here and the lizards and the snakes and, mm-hmm. and all these things, because that's what makes, you know, and that's what makes the world go around. Yeah. I definitely resonate with the idea of we don't have to fight over the same pie. We could bake another pie. Yeah. One with blackberries. No, that's not right. We can, we should be, they One should not be, they should not be separate pies. Yeah. Separate but equal pies. We have they a mixed should be fruit pie. the same pies, mixed fruit pies, yeah. but two of them. Yeah. Or two three mixed, of them or four or of them or, or a whole buffet of pies. Yeah. We can, we can make more pies. I yeah. mean, that's the thing is we can, we can create more public land, it, but, but I think in the industry, it's not even the public land that's the issue. You've got the public. So you've got within the hunting community, yeah. the public land pressure issue. Yeah. Which, which is, is real. Yes, that is a real thing. And that needs to get resolved. Within the industry, it's a marketing dollars competition issue. It is. And in, like, in nonprofit, it's grant dollars. Yep, Grant right? dollars for nonprofits, marketing dollars for, for uh, the industry. But the thing is, if we build more hunters and more anglers that increases that revenue Mm -hmm. and there may be a short period where it shrinks where certain people who got you know to get paid to do certain projects for brands and companies are not going to get to do those things like I, i see it similar to like social media right when we looked at traditional media right like in two in the early 2000s you turned on outdoor TV or real tree TV and that was the outdoor industry. Right. Mm-hmm. Of course you had your big conventions and stuff. And then today you still have all of that programming on TV and you have the programming on social media. Right. And so like, yeah, I'm sure like to me, it's not a dissimilar dynamic when we shifted the, when the model shifted from like traditional media to social media. Right. I'm sure if you were a guy who just had his TV show that that pie shrunk for you, right? Yeah, and you got bitter probably. And you got I mean, super bitter about it. Like I was I was talking earlier about like Heartland Bow Hunter, right? Like in their style of filming, right? Like they revolutionized outdoor TV. And now everybody kind of has a similar style that's progressed from that, but the pie changes, right? Like the dynamic changes and what I see is just a lag. Like it's just a curve and 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 my hope is that people feel energized by opportunities. Versus seeing like a scarcity mindset. Yeah. Because I don't see it that way, right? Like I just see like when there's relative scarcity in the market, that means there's abundant opportunity. And demand. And demand. Yeah. And it's, I like I like the way you put it. Reorganize. Use your energies to reorganize and move forward. Yeah. Rather than complaining about the state of affairs. What do you got planned for HOC this coming, this coming year? Yeah, so we're going to do some some like intro to hunting opportunities. You know, that'll be like kind of just afternoon conversations and, and talking with people about what hunting is about and what the model is here in Texas. Um, we've got, I think, four hunts planned in the state. So we're kind of like, that's the other thing I was like, I'm very passionate about Texas, right? I was really happy to move home after 11 years. And, and you know, I, I tell people that 
probably my two favorite places are the piney woods in west texas right mm which are places that don't get a ton of love. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, so, so that part of what we're going to do is going to showcase uh, some of those, some of those terrains and those geographies. So we'll do a hunt. Uh, we'll do two deer hunts. I think we're going to do an all dad hunt. And then uh, of course we got to do a waterfowl hunt because I love waterfowl. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll do one down on the coast, but yeah, that's the plan for right now. We may do some additional hog hunts uh, as time allows, but Really, these are just going to be opportunities that folks can can put their name in the hat for and, you know, hopefully hold space together and, and learn from one another. Because I know I always have a ton to learn from people. That's the plan. So we'll start hunting in, in October and we'll hunt through February. Nice. Well, hopefully yeah. you come out here for some upland. Yeah, I'm hoping we'll, we'll throw some upland in the mix because, yeah. you know, I love the birds. <laughs> the little <laughs> yeah, dinosaurs, the right? <laughs> yeah. The birds are fun and the dogs are fun. Yeah, I think and the the dog work is that's the other part about waterfowling that I love is is watching the dogs, right? The dogs, man. Man, when the, when the dogs do, you know, three four hundred, you know, three four hundred yard blind retrieve, you know, and the dog just locks up, you're like, oh my god, how did you do that? <laughs> right? <laughs> you're like, yeah, I, yeah, I couldn't do that. Yeah, I couldn't do that at all. No, yeah, that's pretty cool. What are you most excited about, like this coming year? Like, if I had to ask you one thing. Like, this one thing. Yeah. I think the thing I'm most excited about is just the number of people who are energized to support this mission. Right. Just, I think that I've been very fortunate and connected with a ton of people who are just giving, right. Giving of their time, giving of their knowledge uh, and seeing that come into reality through these events is, is for me really, really meaningful. And, and, you know, if one person I think we'll probably reach an audience of maybe 30 or 40 new hunters. Right. And if one person decides to continue to hunt, that's a major win for me. Yeah. It's a huge win. It's a huge, huge win. win. Well, and providing the space for people to come into, it's one of the things I put one of the, oh, so we always talk about our drink that we're having, by the way. Oh yeah. This is delicious. We normally do this oh, yeah. earlier. Should we do in this the first? Show. We <laughs> normally do this earlier in the okay. show, but I've just been sipping. I'm like almost finished. Shout out to Howler Brothers. Yeah, this, <laughs> drinking out of this Howler Brothers glass here. But normally, my man Whiskey T, yeah. the drink slinger, the distiller extraordinaire, Mr. All Hands, all out and about the town guy, comes and makes a cocktail for us. But okay. I happen to be on a booze cleanse right now, yeah. which I thought meant you drink nothing but booze. <laughs> Turns out that's not what a booze it's cleanse is. It's the opposite. It's not. It's not boozing, and um, and you don't. I don't you drink. Don't, no, you don't drink. No. And so we made a mocktail, and um, maybe I'll put together. I'm not even going to put together a video because this is so easy to make. This is La Croix, okay, cranberry raz, yeah, um, like with about an ounce of pomegranate juice in it, okay, some rosemary and a lemon slice. It's delicious. I'm into it. If you did like drink, this would probably be delicious with vodka. Okay. But, you know. So, and if I was not on a cleanse, maybe it would have some in it. Do we have a vodka sponsor yet? No. Well, all hands should make, like you could do this with an all hands cocktail. Yeah. You could definitely like just take one of their cocktails, add a little pomegranate to it and throw like Wham, a, bam, a, spider man. We're done. Yeah. That's it. And you'd, yeah. be, you'd be good to go. Be a great post post hunt drink sort of in this spring where it's a little warmer. Yeah. So maybe turkey hunting, maybe post turkey hunting in the spring. Yeah. I can't wait for turkey. What birds are you going to chase? I don't know where all I'm going to hunt birds. I'm definitely going to shoot one here on the ranch because I've been hearing them and they're all like, blah, 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 and they like it every time they do it. I'm like, Oh man, where are you? Where yeah, are you? Where are you? It, Come yeah, show your, show I have to wait till April 1st. <laughs> so I was thinking about, Running, uh, I was thinking about running the like maybe Pennsylvania, maybe Nebraska. I don't, I don't know yet. Yeah, like I have to like post actually this podcast. I'm gonna sit down this evening and I'm gonna kind of try to draw out the rest of my plan. But it's really kind of like a this is an impulse thing. I'm very impulsive. This is an impulse thing. Like I heard turkeys sounding off on this ranch. And I was like, man, I can't shoot any of these birds till April 1st. I need to get in my car and go shoot a turkey. <laughs> How long have you been turkey hunting? I've only been turkey hunting about six years. Okay. I've shot three turkeys in that time. And I try every year. 
I'm a terrible turkey hunter. Yeah. But but I'm kind of doing it myself. Are you, a, are you a box call guy, a diaphragm guy? Uh, I I box call, but I've moved to a diaphragm. Okay. So, and this year I think I'm going to try to do everything with a di- diaphragm. Okay. I'm not a no decoy guy yet, but that's where I'd like to get. I'd like to get to a place where like decoys are not part of the mix. You're going to become a purist and only use like, you're going to like voice call, <laughs> no decoys. You know, I've got a friend of mine, this guy, um, Cameron Weddington. He came out and shot a turkey here when I was his Texas turkey. He's, he's going for the, I can't remember what it's called. It's the slam. the slam, but it's not the slam. It's the state slam. It's like one, a turkey in yeah, every, so he's Oh, every wow. State. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I think he's on like 20 something. They do the 49s. He's going to pick up the one at Hawaii and all that. Yeah. That's his plan. That's, yeah, yeah. that's his plan. So yeah. he came here to shoot his tur- his bird and watching him turkey hunt. It was, it was art. I yeah. mean, art. The guy mouth calls just like, he's like, yeah, I brought this turkey wing with me so that I can like mimic a fly down, you yeah. know, like he, he'll, he'll like yeah. and mimic, mimic the fly. Down. It's really cool. It's beautiful art. And so I'm kind of going at it with like just calling people who know more than me. You know, I know enough to be dangerous, but not going out with a lot of mentors, doing a lot of it on my own, which is going to take me. 10 times longer to get good at it. Yeah. If at all. But I thought I was a great turkey hunter. So I had a ton of turkeys on my family's ranch and yeah. you know, shot a number of birds yeah. and then moved to Virginia and didn't shoot a bird for seven years. <laughs> <laughs> so you were just in a, in a place of yeah, rich I was just opportunity. In a, I was in a place of abundance. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. But the birds are very, you know, an Eastern is a very different bird than a Rio and Rios are tough. You know, I think Rios are kind of easy, man. They Do talk you? a lot. Yeah. Hate to tell you this yeah. one, but yeah, the, the consensus is that so, Rios are pretty killable birds. This the Rios on this ranch, like they go really far away from where you're at. Like they, mm-hmm. I mean, like they move a whole lot today. That's what I've noticed. Is like the same birds are moving all over the place. They're now, not you, hanging out in one. Are place. you a running gun guy? or Are you a call and sit guy? No, I'm a running gun guy. Yeah, try I'm, try calling and sitting. I'm way too impatient for for calling and sit. This is why. This is why I upland bird hunt. Yes. Because I like to move. <laughs> I like to move. You know, it makes me an okay deer hunter. And I probably would be a better turkey hunter if I was better at like just staying up. I just can't do it. So how long? Okay. Let me ask you this question. This is a tactics. How long okay. are you sitting after each call sequence? So I'm probably going to sit in an area for like an hour, hour and a half. So yeah. I'm there for a while. Yeah, and I'm probably like a four hour guy. Like four, just sit there for yeah, four man, hours. Yeah, that bird's going to circle they're gonna, back. They're going to yeah. come around? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to try that. I'm going to try your four hour method, and I'll let you know how it goes. Yeah. And I'm going to do it on opening day here. So I had this one bird um, here. This is my first year of turkey hunting. This one bird. And I did sit for a long time on this bird. This is like maybe three hours I should sit. This bird was roosted across the big field that we hunted today. Okay. So if you're in that big field, south is this direction in it. Mm-hmm. This bird was on the west side of the field. And so I set up on the east side of the field and tried to call that bird over to me, like over and over and over again. And that turkey would come off the roost. I'd hear him gobble, gobble, maybe kind of strut. I could hear him working the, the tree line. And he just never came across. Yeah. So frustrated. I But I decided that I wasn't going to go over there and try to shoot the bird off the roost. I was going to try to get this bird to come across to me. And so I did that for like this bird. And I did this for like maybe like a week and a half, like the last week and a half of season. Like we did this dance and I just like, you know, I'd be there for like the morning and then I'd be like, fuck it. And I'd leave. Yeah. So the last day, same dance. Turkey comes off the roost. He's just blowing up, blowing up. Can't get him to come across the field to me. So I'm like, you know what? I'm done. This is the last day of the season. I drive back to the house. And this is this was my first turkey, actually. Okay. And so and so I drive back to the house. I'm just like pff, getting ready to put my gun up. I'm like, and I'm getting ready to walk in the house, and all of a sudden, I hear this bird. I'm like, oh shit, there's a bird. <laughs> so I like run out and I run down to an oak tree. And I sit on this oak tree and I hit the box collar. <laughs> And like I sat and I waited and like 30 minutes later, this, this bird came out. It was a nice, it was probably 
11 inch beard, he's you know, dragger. He had like, yeah. yeah, like 20, I think he's 22 pound bird. Big bird. And I shot him in the face. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> and it was cool. And it was the last day. So two days later, I'm driving the ranger underneath the roost where that bird was that I'd been calling to. And that bird ran across right in front of the ranger, like 15 feet in front of the ranger. And it was a triple bearded freaking Tom. <laughs> this, this beer, like big, long yeah. dragon, three yeah. beards runs right across the front of my ranger. Yeah. And that was the bird that had been eluding you, giving me the middle fan. Yeah, man. For like a whole thing. He's got to scratch out a living. Yeah. And he, he did. He, and, and I never saw that bird again. <laughs> no, I, I, uh, I'm a big scout guy, right? So if I see a bird in a field for three days, I'm going to just go sit that field and ride that bird out. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, I think there's many tactics with turkey hunting as there are with elk hunting or anything. Right. And everybody's got a style. My, my style is, is, is to scout them hard. Uh, I'm not the world's best caller. I, I'm terrible at diaphragms. I'm pretty good on a slate over glass, you know, but yeah, man, I love turkeys. I don't know. I got to just get back into it now that I'm home. Yeah. I, I love eating turkeys. Oh yeah. Like, I love eating turkeys like turkey. Actually, turkey heart is probably one of my favorite things. Yeah. Like the heart of the turkey is just delicious. Maybe we should shoot some turkeys this year. Let's do it, man. Let's shoot some turkeys. That'd Let's be pretty do fun. It. Yeah, I definitely. You can come over here and try to shoot one of these wily birds. We used to have a lot more birds here. That flood that happened, Memorial Day flood like six years ago, seven years ago. We used to have all those big um, cypress trees on the river. Yep. That was the roost yep. area. So we lost all their roost, but the flood happened in the middle of the night and we lost the turkeys with the roost. Yeah. Like it really hammered the population. I used to see a couple hundred birds. It's all about habitat, man. It is all about habitat. So there's no more roost and no more turkeys, but I think we're kind of regenerating. Yeah. Last year was a pretty bad year. We only saw a couple of poults around here. We've been on a hard drought too. And it's, you know, I always think about that, right? Like we think it's hot, but we go inside in the AC. <laughs> These birds got to find <laughs> water. No AC. Yeah, they got yeah. no AC. The best they can do is find a mesquite tree to lie yeah. under. You yeah. know, it's it's definitely. Um, I don't know, man. I think that's what I love about you know when we talked earlier about hunting and just the animals. It's just I'm just perplexed by it. You know, I'm just like, how does this ant? Like, I remember you know we had that hard freeze earlier this year, and it was like 17 degrees and. I took, I don't know why, but I thought it was a great day to take my six and four year old out deer hunting, right? Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, man. You got to get these kids to be tough, right? Um, I got two buddy heaters going and hot chocolate and all that, had, trying to have a good time. But it's like, man, I'm uncomfortable, but I don't live out here, right? Yeah, you can go home. You get to go home. I get like, to go home and take yeah. a, a nice hot shower and, and drink some coffee. But yeah, man, I just, I don't know. These animals just, I just love them, you know? Yeah. Yeah, me too. And it's one I mean, way, it's, right? I get it. Like, it's one way, but it, it, it's just, uh, it's one of those things that I just can't shake. Yeah. I love the, I love, I love watching them as much as I do. I mean, that's the hunting them, right? The hunting is watching them and observing them. And I really think that that's the best, that's the best part of the whole thing. And I think it's one of the things that people who don't hunt or haven't considered hunting much, I think it's one of the things they don't understand is how much the observing the animal is the really fun part. Yeah. It, you know, it's a, uh, to me, I always tell people like at this point in, in my hunting, the heart, you know, I hate, it's not harvesting, it's killing animals, right? The yeah. killing of the animals. And that is, is not the most joyous part to me. It's really, yeah. I always feel like, you know, whether it's a bird or it's a deer or whatever it is, like there's, there's always a moment of sadness for me. Right. And a reflection of like the sentient being is, is no longer, here because of my action right and there's a gravity to that but the the making of the meat and and of like preparing something for people and and having that moment of connection right like i um you know shout out to virginia right virginia has one of the most underrated fisheries in the country in my opinion right everything you can chase on the texas coast you can chase in virginia right so you're chasing maybe not snook right but you're chasing you know, redfish and specks and flounders, right? And these and these tidal marshes. And you know, I'd go catch redfish and and you know, bring it home and and show my kids, right? And make a meal with them and have them see like there's this thing that I went and plucked out of its its habitat mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And now we're going to have this incredible meal and eat it together and leave the head on, right? Let them see the Uh, eyes and and have that connection. And and for me, it's just important, right? I want to, you know, I was raised in a way that was very mindful uh, and I really want to be, you know, continue that, that intention that my parents set and, and, and bring that forward into my kids. It's such a connection. It's the connection. It's connection to nature. It's a connection to nature that we, as humanity, I think can so easily lose. We can so easily sever that tie. Well, it's like, you know, we talk about like othering people, right? But I feel like so much we sort of like othered animals, right? Mm-hmm. And we've said like, oh, they're this thing that's separate from us or mm-hmm. that we're somehow mm-hmm. devoid of them, right? Like bugs are a great example. Like I'm working on bugs with my kids, right? Like they're yeah. not big on bugs. I get yeah. it. But I'm like, you know, hey, this thing's incredible, right? And yeah. this thing has, you know, just as much right to exist here as you do. And you're really showing them an appreciation for something that they may find off putting. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, we were talking when we were hunting a little bit about like you know, snow geese and, and kind of one of the things with waterfowling is a lot of just like, you know, in terms of regulation, you really have to just remove the breasts. Right. But there are these, you know, even the feet, right? Like if you look at like old, and I learned all this from other people, but like old school stock recipes used a lot of chicken feet. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, and you make these like just these incredibly velvety, delicious uh, stocks, right? All that and so collagen. it's like, and all the collagen and everything, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So it's like, you know, learning, and that's actually something I learned on that HOC hunt, right? It was like throw the feet in, right? Mm-hmm. Like I never threw feet in anything, mm-hmm. but yeah, using that whole animal and, and just appreciating every aspect of it as best you can. It was it was really kind of fun this year. I was walking out of a field and found like a single feather, right? And I was like, I don't know, man, I just put it in and carried it with me for a while, you know, because it's like, I don't know what bird this came from. It came from one of the million birds that were traversing the terrain that we were in. But like, I got to keep one piece of it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really, that's really neat when you get to carry a piece like a, like a feather from a bird. And like, maybe it's overly sentimental, but like, I don't think there's anything wrong with being a little sentimental. No, I think, I think that's something that happens the more time you spend outdoors. I think you get a little more. Yeah, it's a more reflective. I, th- I think it's almost even it's just reflective. You become reflective, like, and symbols and things that you carry with you become something that you meditate on that brings you back to reflection of the time you you spent outdoors. And I'm excited to be on as many of the things with you this fall as I can be. Yeah, man, to help other people get that connection. Yeah, I think that's the thing for me that really energizes me. It's just. You know, it may not be for you, right? And that's why they make chocolate and vanilla. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But it's for me and I want to tell you about it, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I, I absolutely, I really hope that, you know, I know that we're going to do some some hunts together. And, yeah. you know, I hope people just see your passion and, and, and the team that you have working with you to, like, see that all of this exists to help build connection, right? Like, you know, I love, I'm not big on, on deer taxidermy, right? But, I, you know, I like European mounts and stuff, but the, the duck mounts for me are, I just want people to see how beautiful that duck is, right? Because, like, you're never going to be three feet away from a, a, a wild pintail, right? Like, it's just not going to happen, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, seeing that seeing that mount or seeing that duck, you know, someone's someone's killed and it's in their in their sling, right, or in their, in their game tote, like, there's a connection there. You see how beautiful nature is. Yeah, it's really, you know. There's an irony there, right? Like, you killed this thing to say it looks so beautiful. Yeah. But like, there's also like, there's so much more there. You know, what's interesting about that is I was very against taxidermy before I became a hunter. And even in my early phases of hunting, I was not into taxidermy. And I wouldn't say I'm into taxidermy now, but I think where I finally did the the switch turned for me was like, man, I love going to like the museum of natural history <laughs> like, and I love it because you, there's these, you're next to these taxidermied animals. I mean, like you get to look at them yeah. up close and the birds that I hunt, you get to consume the meat. You can taxidermy a pelt off of them. And that becomes like your feather, this thing that's a reflection. You get to look at it. I don't need to taxidermy everything I yeah. shoot. You know, but a few of them, the things that are beautiful. Yeah. Especially the ducks. Especially yeah. the ducks. Yeah. Uh, because they're a, so cool. They're just cool, man. I just nerd out on them all the time. Like, um, but yeah, I just, you know, I think 
the thing for me that I really want people to know is that this space, like the outdoors doesn't, you don't have to do it the way I'm doing it. Right. And I realize that at times I do it in a pretty intense way. Like, I don't know a lot of guys that have a full-time job and kids who go like sit in a cornfield, right. Or who make these like big trips out to North Dakota or wherever else I'm going to go chase us with my buddies. But like, you know, it doesn't have to look that way for you to enjoy it. Right. Yeah. Um, it could just look like you, I remember like it's kind of a side, but when COVID was happening, a friend of my wife's posted on, on social media, she was going outside for a walk. Right. In my mind, like going outside for a walk is like going on a trail, right? Mm. And what she meant was literally walking on this like path around uh, basically a stormwater tank in her neighborhood, right? Mm. And I was like dismissive of it at first. And then I thought like, man, how arrogant are you that you're like judging her experience of connection, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. Like if for her walking and seeing, you know, the potato chip ducks in her local pond, connects her and re-energizes her then that's amazing and incredible and you should be supportive of it yeah you support it bring that individual to the edge of it their comfort zone and try to leave some breadcrumbs for them to follow those breadcrumbs past correct so that the next thing they know they find themselves deep in the woods appreciating nature in a fully immersive way and you're 100 percent right that being dismissive of it is not the way to get people there. It's not, you know, and I think a lot of times, particularly when we get, you know, into the folks that are, I would say beyond avid, right. There is an opera. There's sometimes a culture where we dismiss newcomers, right. Or we say like, Oh, they don't have the good gear or they're shooting this or whatever it is. And it's like, you know, you were that person once. Like I remember when I went and bought my first, package rifle from a dick sporting goods store because it was 300 bucks and it was on sale mm-hmm. right because it's what i could afford and i think that's one of the things for me that you know we're doing you know and patagonia is not in the hunting space right they're very clearly not in the hunting space but we've been talking with them about you know we've participated in some events at their store in austin which is like the gear you have can get you out there right so it doesn't need to be you know Sitka or Duck Camp or whatever. And those are great quite quality brands, right? It's like if you're gonna get serious about it, like I encourage you to go check them out. But you know, this jacket that I'm wearing, the jacket you're wearing, you know, the the hiking shoes that you have, like stuff that folks already have, the message should be like, hey, that works. Mm-hmm. Right? Like yeah. because yeah. I think one of the things is like the barrier to entry, you know, it is gear, right? So like we should as as hunters and then people who care about conservation think about what gear can i share right like when i upgrade my stuff right what can i share with somebody maybe it's not give it to them right but it's like bring it along on a hunt i've got boxes of stuff that i have upgraded from that i just i keep and like it's there and when i'm on a hunt and somebody needs something Oh, hey, yeah, I've got this. And you know what? A lot of times if they want to keep it after the hunt. I'm good with it. Great. You and know, hopefully they, they, you know, get obsessed and spend all their money on it like I do. And then, yeah. And then <laughs> yeah. I mean, like I've got, you know, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it, yeah. I mean, that, that's my thing, right? Is like what you already have can work and maybe it doesn't work for you going and sitting in a duck blind in 10 degree weather. Yeah. Right. And yeah. That, that's part of, I think too, is that we don't need to bring people into this for them to suffer their way through it. Right. We need to bring people into this and as a mentor and as someone teaching them do it in a way that they enjoy it. Right. So like, I, you know, I call myself out for taking my girls out like pretty miserable weather. (laughs) Right. But like they're bundled up in their ski gear. Right. They're bundled up and warm and like, yeah, we didn't see a single deer. Right. But like, were they warm? Were they drinking hot chocolate? Were they having a good time? And like, guess what? Next time they see me geared up and headed out the door, they're asking to go. Yeah. Right. Well, and what's cool about that is that you acknowledge the weather. You acknowledge that the thing you were asking them to do might be outside of their comfort zone. And you took the time to make the space inviting for them. And then you took full responsibility of their experience from the moment it started to the time that it ended. Yeah. And I think that's 
very much a parallel in a good mentorship program and in a good in in a good foster anybody into the outdoors. That, and that and that's ultimately like what my goal is, right? Which is to show people a model that creates space for people to learn. Yeah. Right. And it doesn't have to look like me putting you in a deer blind and telling you to tough it out. <laughs> right. In fact, it's the opposite. Be back for you. I'll be back for you. <laughs> right. I'll be back for you in six hours and hope you enjoy it. Right. Yeah. Like, you know, if I got to carry, you know, two extra propane tanks and three don't Mr. shoot a button, box. three Mr. Buddy heaters, you know, like I want to do that. Cause it, at the end of the day for me, the biggest compliment for when I take somebody out hunting is them asking me to go again. Yeah. Big time. Like, it's just like, that's what I get out of it is like knowing that like I've planted a seed or help sow a seed in somebody where they get excited about this. So they're like, you know, there was this meme a while back, but it's like, I saw that deer right there. I saw a deer there a week ago. You know, the guy's like telling his wife about it. Right. Like, <laughs> you know, it's like that, that's the level of like passion that I have. Right. Um, and, and not everyone's going to get to that point, but I hope they start, you know? Well, on that note, a, I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank you for going on a hunt with me. I want to tell you that I would like to go hunt with you again. (laughs) (laughs) I appreciate that. The feeling's mutual. (laughs) Thanks for showing me the ranch, man. I have a real passion for, for ranches in Texas, you know, particularly as we see all the development pressure and and subdivision after subdivision going up, there's a real, there's a real personal thing for me to see ranches stay intact. And I get why they don't, but um, you know, families and people that are committed to keeping the land, the land, is uh, deeply meaningful for me, man. So thanks for having me out. Thanks, man.